This is a video about why capitalism is better than socialism. And as a capitalist, I like to make money. So here's an ad from My Patriot Supply. Friends, the coming year is likely to bring more painful surprises. Are you ready? Do you have a plan in case of food shortages, power outages, emergency evacuations, mandates? You should always prepare before these things strike. That's why we recommend getting emergency food from My Patriot Supply. They're America's number one preparedness company, with several million happy, well-prepared customers. Their food lasts up to 25 years in storage. It's like a survival insurance policy you can eat. When you need it, it will be there. Right now, you'll save $100 on a three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. This kit can get you through any difficulties ahead. You get breakfast, lunch, dinner, and drinks, averaging over 2,000 calories a day. These food kits from My Patriot Supply are selling fast. So hurry and act. Go to preparewithsteven.com and save $100 on your three-month food kit. That's preparewithsteven.com. To avoid what happens after disaster strikes, act now. Preparewithsteven.com. That's Steven spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Um, as is often said, communism will win. So, you know, regardless of how we get there, it will win. Hi everyone. This video will be released to the public on Christmas Eve. I will be home by a fire, enjoying some much needed time off. Merry Christmas to those in my audience who celebrate. To those who don't, I hope you have a pleasant evening. But I have to say, you're really missing out. You see, even as an atheist, I love Christmas. It's truly a wonderful holiday and always manages to lift my spirits. Though, we should be mindful of the plight of others. Some people out there aren't so lucky. For them, Christmas isn't a cause for celebration. It's one of the darkest, most depressing times of the year. I'm of course referring to tankies, who will no doubt be crying in their pillows over the next few days as we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's right, on December 26, 1991, the Soviet Union officially ceased to exist as a political entity, and people like Ben Norton have been sour ever since. For me, it's just something that makes the Christmas season even brighter, and make no mistake, people should celebrate this occasion. The Soviet Union earned its nickname Evil Empire, and its collapse was an enormous blow practically and ideologically to Marxism, which is an evil ideology. To their credit, most online leftists, including self-identified socialists, have the good sense to disavow the Soviet Union, as well as other communist powers of that era. Some are just not far left enough to even see the appeal to begin with. And by the way, I'm not a democratic socialist of America, uh, and now the last part will make, might make people even the most angry. Um, comrade? No, nah, I'm not calling anybody a comrade, okay? So it's incredibly stupid politics, okay? like. And and I'm not going to do it. Uh, and I don't. And you're not my comrade. Uh, okay, you're, you're my, you know your uh, fellow citizen. I love you. I'm going to fight for you like no one fights for you. But I'm not calling you comrade. Uh, and I'm not using Soviet terminology. It's incredibly stupid. So sorry. Some characterize these authoritarian regimes as bastardizations of Karl Marx's vision. Others, like Richard Wolff try and have things both ways by, as an afterthought, condemning the crimes against humanity, while also saying that capitalism was worse, and that these nations' redeeming qualities surpassed what capitalism provides, and that while they're not calling for central planning of the economy, Soviet Russia was a great example of the success it can have, which of course they count as a point in favor of their ideology. All those people aside, you still have people like Ben Norton worming around who genuinely believe that the world is the worst place today because the United States won the Cold War, and that pretty much every geopolitical problem today exists because of the United States. And while their specific views on the Soviet Union might be obscure, they're still popular thinkers within the online left on other subjects, and many of their peripheral arguments reverberate online and influence slightly more reasonable people. Their arguments against supposed Western imperialism are particularly popular. It was America's fault is the online left's favorite, and let's be real here, one of their only foreign policy arguments. And tankies provide useful commentary for them to regurgitate. For example, here's Jank Uger repeating Ben Norton's article, We Created Islamic Terrorism. Those blaming Islam for ISIS would have supported Osama bin Laden in the 1980s. I got it. It's logical. At the time, they thought, Soviet Union is godless. How are we going to get all these Muslims to be on our side versus their side? It's a billion people on the planet at the time, right? I got it. We'll activate their religion. 
will tell them, go fight those no good atheist communists. So go more towards religion, go more towards fundamentalism, but now you need to fight them too, so I'm going to give you weapons and I want you to be in favor of militant fundamentalism. Ben Norton, who wrote, wrote, wrote about this in Salon in a great piece, says, there are extremists in every religion, but they tend to be few in number, weak and isolated. Salafism, which is similar to Wahhabism that, I, that I've been talking about, in its modern militarized form has its origins in the 1920s and even before. For decades, this movement remained weak and isolated. Yet in the 1970s and 80s, Western capitalist governments, particularly the U.S., came up with new Cold War strategy, supporting these fringe Islamic extremist groups as a bulwark against socialism. See, the socialists were secular, and we couldn't have it, because that meant that they were leading towards communism. Capitalism had to win. We started the fire, <laughs> and we did it to fight godless communism, and now that fire has engulfed us all, and we turn around and, what, blame Muslims in general, and more importantly, think that the answer is a military answer. If we bomb them enough, or we fund weapons to the good guy <laughs> militant fundamentalists that are on our side, including Saudi Arabia, that'll be the answer. Does it look like it's the answer? One final quote from Norton for you guys. This Cold War strategy ended up being successful. After the fall of the USSR, the secular socialist groups that dominated the resistant movements of the Middle East were replaced by Islamic extremists, ones that had previously been supported by the West. I guess we should uh, hang a mission accomplished banner up. For tankies, the imperialism card works on multiple levels. Not only does it speak to the inherent evil of the Western capitalist governments in and of itself, it also serves as a catch-all explanation for any bad things that happen throughout the world. And most importantly, it serves as an explanation for why global socialism failed. Left to itself, socialism surely would have thrived, but evil imperialist capitalist saboteurs couldn't allow that to happen. So they sought to derail socialist movements at every turn, short-circuiting potential socialist success stories everywhere. And sadly, many of the nations compared are now capitalist countries with vastly worse outcomes thanks directly to capitalist efforts at sabotaging and destabilizing them. My goal, and the goal of all Marxists, is to recreate this study by increasing the sample size of socialist countries. Maybe you can help us! If you truly care for empirical evidence, try not lobbying for the sanctioning and bombing of fletching socialist states, and we'll talk. Jokes aside though, yeah, after 1991 the sample size falls to a level that makes it kinda pointless, cause then you're comparing a handful of countries against over a hundred. Interestingly, even with that sample size, at similar levels of development those few countries still do better than their capitalist counterparts. I wonder why? The Soviet-Afghan war is probably the best known example on this front. The United States funded the Mujahideen in their battles against the Soviet-backed government and the Red Army itself. These efforts were successful, overthrowing that government while pushing back the Russians, which served as a major blow for the Soviet Union. Not only had the Russians expended tons of resources in this losing campaign, it did a great deal of damage to their international prestige. Except the people who America supported were even worse, and they made Afghanistan worse, and they started doing terrorism, and that's why bad things happen now. Or so the tankies tell me. If you want to know the more nuanced history of this conflict, there are a number of great videos here on YouTube summarizing it. But let's just consider the tanky framework for the time being. America, out of capitalist greed, thwarted socialist movements throughout the world. These efforts were successful in that they contributed to the destruction of global socialism, but the people America backed were so bad that the world is now considerably worse for it. Unfortunately for tankies, the imperialism destroyed the Soviet Union explanation doesn't work for a number of reasons. And as I'll argue, it goes a long way in demonstrating that socialism failed the USSR in a major way. Before I begin, I will concede that America did attempt to thwart socialist movements throughout the world. I am glad that the United States headed this project, as I believe socialism winning would have been far worse for the world. I will also concede that not every intervention conducted by the United States was wise or moral. That said, the US sabotage and imperialism derailed socialism argument fails on multiple levels. For starters, imperialism, if you want to call it that, wasn't just done by the Americans. The Cold War was very much defined by proxy conflicts across the globe between the Soviet Union and the United States. And not all of these proxy conflicts were just America trying to derail genuine workers' movements. What communist apologists then and today refuse to admit is that the Soviet Union was a major imperial power. 
And while they whinge about the meanies the United States supported, as we'll see, there was no bottom to the Soviet imperialism barrel. Make no mistake, the Soviet Union was, as its leaders frequently said, on a mission to achieve global ideological predominance. They just didn't see their mission as imperial in nature. They believed that imperialism was just another form of bourgeoisie class suppression. The capitalist class was exploiting the resources of these underdeveloped nations for the purpose of turning a profit. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, sought to stop that, and bring these people democracy and revolution. These were not equivalent goals in their view. As Lenin wrote in Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, to the numerous old motives of colonial policy, finance capital has added the struggle for resources of raw materials, for the export of capital, for spheres of influence, i.e., for spheres for profitable deals, concessions, monopoly profits, and so on, economic territory in general. Compare this to what Lenin advocated for around the globe. In an address to the Second Congress of the Comintern, Lenin called for worldwide revolution. He told the group their task is to arouse the working masses to revolutionary activity, to independent action and to organization, regardless of the level they have reached, to translate the true communist doctrine, which was intended for the communists of the more advanced countries, into the language of every people, to carry out those practical tasks which must be carried out immediately, and to join the proletarians of other countries in a common struggle. Lenin was an unorthodox Marxist thinker. He believed that revolutions could happen in nations that weren't industrialized. This was obscure among Marxist scholars at the time, and therefore virtually the entire world was in play. Again, they didn't see these ambitions as imperial in nature. In fact, the Soviet Union didn't even use the term Cold War until the Gorbachev era, because calling it that would imply there were two belligerents. So, from its very beginnings, the Soviet Union operated with a global ideology, and while they may not have called it imperialism, they certainly had the ambition to export it to every corner of the earth. Lenin believed that Russia, as the first major nation with a successful workers' revolution, occupied a special place in history and had a unique role in fomenting global revolution. In order to assist and promote revolutions throughout the world, the Bolsheviks established the Communist International or Comintern in 1919. Headquartered in Moscow, the Comintern invited all workers' parties throughout the world to join. Among other things, the Comintern developed a strategy for implementing socialist revolutions in the Third World. Their plan was to ally themselves with the peasantry and the rural poor in order to overthrow colonial governments and whatever additional bourgeoisie structures were in place. At the time of the establishment of the Comintern, Russia was still embroiled in a civil war. Soviet reach was quite limited at this point. That said, the Bolsheviks were seeking to be the inheritors of the Russian Empire, and they weren't going to settle for only having part of it. The Russian Empire was a massive, multi-ethnic, multilingual polity. In the immediate aftermath of the 1917 revolution, various enclaves within the empire broke off to form their own administrations. But, as Adarn Vestad wrote in The Global Cold War, whenever the principles of national sovereignty came into conflict with those strategic needs of the new Soviet state, the latter representing the needs not only of the proletarians within Russia, but also worldwide, the Communist Party opted for the latter. Reclaiming the outer regions of the old empire started with Ukraine, which had already established its own parliament known as the Rada. In December of 1917, Lenin said that, even if the Rada had received full formal recognition as the uncontested organ of supreme state power of an independent bourgeois Ukrainian republic, we would have been forced to declare war on it without any hesitation, because of its attitude of unexampled betrayal of the revolution and support of the bitterest enemies of the national independence of the peoples of Russia and of the working of the exploited masses. This totally wasn't imperialism, though. The Soviet Union went on to reclaim most of the lands once held by the Russian Empire and proceeded to expand it. In the late 1930s, Joseph Stalin signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany, which, among other things, was essentially an agreement to carve up Poland between the two nations. Of course, Hitler ultimately violated the pact in 1941, and Russia was all of a sudden at war with Germany. After pushing back Hitler's army on the Eastern Front, by the end of the war, the Soviet Union had standing armies as far west as Germany. Upon arrival, they had no intention of relinquishing it. They believed it was their prize for defeating the Nazis on the Eastern Front. As Adarn Westad writes in The Cold War, A World History, There was no opposition to his dictatorship in the Soviet Union, and Stalin had a hard time imagining any opposition coming out of the new regions his Red Army had conquered. These countries might not be ripe for communism yet, he thought, but they could be guided toward it by his authority 
and the example of the Soviet state. The British and Americans would extend their form of capitalism into the heart of Europe. Stalin would, at least over time, attempt to do the same with his system. It was both an ideological and strategic imperative. This war, Stalin told his Yugoslav communist admirers in April 1945, is not as in the past. Whoever occupies a territory also imposes on it his own social system. Everyone imposes his own system as far as his army can reach. It cannot be otherwise. They didn't even bother with the farce of sham elections in most of these occupied territories. The most contentious issue Stalin had with his capitalist counterparts in the post-war era was what to do with the defeated Germany. The country was only partially occupied by the Red Army, and all the parties involved were becoming increasingly aware of the fact that it would be difficult for the Soviet Union and the nations of Western Europe to peacefully coexist as neighbors. Entire books have been written about the partition and eventual reunification of Germany, so I certainly couldn't do the topic justice here. There is, however, one gem that I came across when doing research on this topic that's relevant to this video. As Vladislav M. Zubak, apologies for butchering your name, sir, wrote in A Failed Empire, the Soviet Union in the Cold War from Stalin to Gorbachev, one more card that Stalin intended to play in Germany was that of German nationalism. Several decades of experience had taught Stalin that nationalism could be a more potent force than revolutionary romanticism and communist internationalism. Molotov recalled, He saw how Hitler managed to organize German people. Hitler led his people, and we felt it by the way Germans fought during the war. In January 1947, Stalin asked the SED delegates, Are there many Nazi elements in Germany? What kind of force do they represent, in particular in the Western zones? The SED leaders admitted their ignorance on this subject. Then Stalin advised them to supplant the policy of eliminating nation of Nazi collaborators by a different one aimed to attract them in order to avoid pushing all former Nazis to the enemy camp. The former Nazi activists should be allowed, he continued, to organize their own party that would operate in the same block with the SED. Wilhelm Pieck expressed doubts as to whether SMAG would permit the formation of such a party. Stalin laughed and said he would facilitate it as much as he could. Semenov took the minutes of the meeting and he recalled Stalin saying, there were overall 10 million members in the Nazi party and they all had families, friends, and acquaintances. This is a big number. For how long should we ignore their concerns? The Kremlin leader suggested a title for their new party, National Democratic Party of Germany. He asked Semenov if Smag could find in some prison a former regional Nazi leader and put him at the helm of this party. When Semenov said that perhaps all of them had been executed, Stalin expressed regrets. He then suggested that the former Nazis should be allowed to have their own newspaper, perhaps even with the title Wirkische Beobachter, the notorious official daily of the Third Reich. Fortunately, that didn't work out for him. What Stalin wanted above all was for Germany to be unified under communist rule. And just look at who he was willing to align himself with to make that happen. Even though the bloodiest war in the history of Europe had just ended, a war that was started in part by German nationalism, Stalin was willing to play footsie with German nationalism to get his goals. Like I said earlier, there was no bottom to that barrel. The United States gets a lot of grief for the people we aligned ourselves with and the spirits we tried to arouse in the fight against global socialism. The most prominent example nowadays was the one I mentioned earlier, Islamic radicalism. But, as I also said earlier, the Soviet analog to this is often ignored. I believe there are two big reasons for this. One is propaganda. A lot of leftist intellectuals choose to focus on the United States and not the Soviet Union. The second is that, since America won so many of these proxy contests and ultimately won the overall Cold War itself, and since the victor of this bipolar conflict was necessarily going to shape the international system for a generation after it ended, we have necessarily lived for some time under an American global order. And we can only compare it to an order that didn't end up existing. Regimes and movements that failed, almost by definition, don't have much visible impact on politics today. But that's another topic for another day. Soviet expansionism and its support for workers' parties continued until the USSR collapsed. Lenin and Stalin mostly concerned themselves with their direct geographical area. Granted, that's a lot of area given how massive the USSR was, but it wasn't until later, when the Soviet Union was more stable, did they undertake the project of expanding socialism to a truly global level. But what does this have to do with the failures of socialism itself? Well, it seriously undermines the argument that sabotage derailed socialism. This is one of the more frequently used explanations. Global socialism ultimately failed because America wouldn't let it succeed. Socialism was never given a fair shake because the capitalists wouldn't allow it. If socialism really sucks so bad, why do capitalist countries work so hard to make sure they fail? Why do they sanction, assassinate, diplomatically vilify, invade, bomb, sabotage, form entire globe-spanning military cooperation, and so much more if socialism would just supposedly crumble under its own weight? Maybe it's because they themselves understand the massive transformative ability of socialist economic systems and are afraid that they'll lose all their power and privilege to it. They understand that very well, actually. It's just they're useful idiots that don't. 
There are two big problems with this. The first one, as I already explained, is that interventions were a two-way street. The forces of international socialism didn't take the sabotage line down, and they also did plenty of sabotaging themselves. The Soviet Union was a massive benefactor for workers' parties and revolutions everywhere in the world. Their aid to Mao's China alone was on the scale of the Marshall Plan. On top of that, the USSR wasn't the only benefactor for socialist movements. Communist China and Yugoslavia also contributed in major ways. The second and more important one is that blaming sabotage is nearly a tautology. Let me explain. Why exactly the Soviet Union collapsed doesn't have a single great answer. Most people who have studied the issue do think that its efforts to bolster regimes throughout the world helped bankrupt the nation. Some of the other factors that supposedly contributed to that collapse are tangential to this. The very emphasis on heavy industry, and a relatively smaller emphasis on light industry, resulted in some level of discontent among certain sectors of the Soviet population. In fact, many people who had a problem with Soviet society complained of primarily one thing, lack of variety or quality in consumer goods. Humans are strange creatures. This, of course, was the strategy of the USSR, and hence was imported without much thought into many socialist countries, resulting in similar shortages, or inadequacies, of consumer goods, and a surplus of heavy industry, for example in countries like Romania or Poland. The Soviet Union allocated too many resources to armaments, many of which went to help foreign regimes, which necessarily meant that they couldn't provide more consumer products, which made their populations quite unhappy. The exact amount of money the Soviet Union spent on military expenditures is hard to find. Go figure, the opaque, dishonest mess that was the Soviet bureaucracy couldn't produce reliable numbers. Estimates range that the total spending was somewhere between 10 and 20% of GDP. America's budget during the Cold War never hit 10% of GDP. The closest it came to that number was during the Vietnam War. So, the United States spent less as a percentage of its economy, and still won the geostrategic arms race. And here's why this is such a blow to socialism as an economic system. The United States and the Soviet Union were comparable in a number of ways. They were pretty close in terms of population, and they were both geographically large with lots of natural resources. The big, notable difference between the two was their economic systems. That's what this whole conflict was about, after all, and that difference was of enormous consequence in these proxy conflicts. America did try to actively undermine socialism pretty much everywhere on the globe, which is a very expensive task. Coups, armaments, and boots on the ground all cost money. Lots of it. And America was able to go blow for blow with the Soviet Union in all of these regards, while spending a smaller portion of its economy while also delivering a higher standard of living for its people. And unlike the Soviet Union, this didn't bankrupt the United States. As many people have argued, most notably the historian Paul Kennedy, a military victory is usually the capstone of an economic victory. The nation that can marshal more resources is way more likely to win on the battlefield. And once again, unlike the Soviet Union, the United States didn't really have to choose between heavy industry and consumer products. Supposedly, Boris Yeltsin knew that the United States was going to win the Cold War when he visited a grocery store and saw that, unlike the Soviet grocery stores, it was well stocked with a variety of goods. When tankies blame sabotage from the United States as one of the principal reasons for the failures of global socialism, they're conceding that their economic system is garbage in a way that they don't really appreciate. If you're able to bankroll all sorts of efforts to sabotage while also delivering a higher standard of living for your citizens, then you probably have an economic system that creates more wealth. The United States' economic system produces more guns and butter. The Soviet Union's economic system produced shortages and failure. Mm.